Good morning, everyone. As you can see, I'm ready for the fall on top, but not on the bottom. I heard we're having some good warm weather coming up here in, in the next few weeks, so maybe it's not quite fall yet, but uh, I don't really have any announcements. I do want to draw your attention to the fact that we're, we have just started our Bible reading challenge. We've called it Word Like Fire from the uh, verse in Jeremiah where God says, is my word not like a hammer and like a fire, or like a fire, like a hammer that splits apart the rocks. So there's this great power in God's word. We want to draw attention to that by the name. Great power to transform us and to change us and to uh, chip away at the parts of us that are not like Christ and to form us into Christ's likeness. So um, I, I just want to say that uh, a lot of Bible reading plans, you start them out kind of like a New Year's resolution and then already within the first week you find yourself behind. I find the pace that we have uh, set in this Bible reading plan to be uh, enjoyable. You have two days per reading. Each reading is you know, somewhere between three to six chapters, and then you even have Sundays off. And uh, so for some of you, you might wish that the reading was a little bit faster, but we do have discipleship communities in which we're studying Daniel. And so we're studying God's Word in what I would call the really slow deliberate slow cooker way and then we're also studying God's word in the 30,000 foot flyover where you're just reading through it and not necessarily studying each passage and I've been really enjoying it. I read actually the first couple of readings with, uh, with my wife out loud at our dinner table and it's just been really good. It's good to have some structure and commitment around um, Bible reading and it was definitely not too late um, to, to join us. Uh, what's due by Monday is uh, Psalm 119, Genesis 1 through 7 and I think John... John 1 through 5, or also John 1 through 7. So it's not a chronological read-through, John 1 through 5. Yeah, and, uh, and it's not a read-through of just book by book. It goes back and forth between the New Testament and Old Testament, and it, uh, it pairs up Old Testament passages with their New Testament teaching as much as it can. So I think it's really interesting and uh, a really powerful way to do it. I've been, I've been enjoying that as well. If you do a straight Bible read-through, which is great as well, you spend three-fourths of your time in the Old Testament. And, um, and oftentimes you're missing the deeper explanations about everything is actually about Christ, which is really revealed specifically and clearly in the New Testament. So hope you join us for that. I also hope that you might, if you're interested in getting more involved at Boone's Ferry, uh, begin to attend one of our discipleship communities. We have two discipleship communities, one led in my house by me and one led by Drew and uh, Drew Camp and Ben Weiss. They're currently meeting in uh, Ben Weiss's house. The addresses are online under our discipleship tab. You can go down and um, you can just show up. They always have food together in potluck, but if you're showing up for the first time, just show up. You don't even need to email the leader. Just, just come. I think it'll be fine that we welcome people really quickly and, and warmly and uh, there's no clickishness. We're just excited for people to join. And uh, if you wanted to show up prepared, you could go down to the bottom of the page on Discipleship Communities and you'll find that uh, the questions for next week are already up there. There's always seven questions and then we discuss those questions together. But you could also just show up and enjoy the, the Bible study and even answer questions if you know Daniel without having studied it specifically. So um, that is one of our key ministries, sort of a heartbeat of Boone's Ferry around discipleship that we meet together and um, eat food together in fellowship, uh, study God's word together and pray together, modeled specifically after the uh, devotion and commitments of the early church that you can find in Acts chapter 2. So I don't really have anything else to draw your attention to, so I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to get into Daniel chapter 4, and beginning in verse 20. Six, which is this is kind of a pinnacle moment so far, and a lot of a lot of the plot threads come together to a real special moment here in Daniel chapter four. So let me pray. Father, I thank you for your word and its transforming power, and how it can light our hearts on fire with zeal and admiration and excitement and enthusiasm for your mission through our lives. How it can convict us and cause us to recognize sin and to confess that sin how it can, uh, and specifically in today's content, humble us from pride unknown, pride known and resistant, and even that really deep, stubborn pride that is so impossible to get rid of that resides deep in us that does not want to be humbled. You know exactly how to humble us, Lord, and I pray that you would humble everyone and that people would not, no longer resist, no longer be blind to, and no longer have any reason to hold on to um, the notion that there is anything that we can earn through our own works, but it's only because of your unmerited grace that we're saved. 
I pray that you would bless this message through your uh, word in Daniel and that there would be significant transformation in my life and the life of the people in this church as a result. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. By a show of hands, how many of you have been to the Wallawas, the Wallawa Mountains? Right near Joseph? Yeah, quite a few. Um, I've only been a couple of times, but I have fallen in love with them and almost find them to be like a... Like I have a, a vision in my life that once my kids are of a certain age, I'm going to take them hiking into the Wallawas pretty regularly, like every single year. And one of the only reasons I haven't been recently is that it's six hours away and I've got six kids and two of them still in diapers kind of thing. And it's just a lot. Um, but there's this camp called Halton Camp. And at the, the camp keeper or the cabin keeper, his name is Dennis Lund. Dennis, if you watch this randomly, uh, I still remember you and I can't wait to come visit you again. And uh, these are like 100-year-old cabins that still have, uh, they have cots in them and they have like wood burning ovens and it's right by Aneroid Lake underneath Aneroid Mountain which I think is 9,800 feet tall so only a couple thousand feet lower than Mount Hood, pretty high up and, and they call the Wallawa Mountain Range kind of like the, I think it's Little Switzerland or something because it's so beautiful and um, so many snow capped mountains and it's just, uh, it's an amazingly beautiful place. And uh, this is a private camp. It's Halton Camp owned by the Halton family. They, they, I think it was a candy family or candy um, company that, that they become well known and made their wealth. And um, you can come up there if you know the cabin keeper. All you have to do, do is know his email and you uh, just type him, hey, I'd like to schedule a time. And then you pay 25 bucks per night for cabin upkeep and you do one hour of work around the camp. And I always request that we get a chop wood because you're in the middle. It just, it really, the, the little valley looks like God just took his finger and carved out a spot between the mountains, put a little lake right there, and you're looking up at these jagged cliffs around you. Depending whether you come in June or a little bit later, there's sometimes actually snow up on some of those, those mountains. And you're just hammering these big rounds of wood for fire for both in the camp and, and, and the campfires. And it's just, it's just amazing. It's like, why would you, that's not even work doing that. Um, there's also brush cutting and different kinds of stuff for the paths. And so uh, we do that, but it's, I, don't, I don't chop wood myself very often. You know, I live in the suburbs and um, if I'm getting wood, I'm, I usually already get it split. And so I'm not good at chopping wood. By the time we're done doing an hour, you kind of get the, uh, get the um, gist of it. But a lot of this wood is, is not rotten, but it's getting there. And so you don't, you, you don't need a sharp ax, you use a maul which is, you know, comes to a point that's not that sharp, you couldn't cut your finger on it, but it gets really wide and so it splits through the wood. And um, it's really kind of amazing how as you get better, you, you not only figure out, you know, distance and spacing and how much strength it really needs to cut through the wood, but you figure out just exactly where to hit it. You know, you start seeing the grain, you start seeing where it's gonna split and just, when you get it right, it's like butter, just splits right through that. And it made me think of Nebuchadnezzar and how God said because of his pride and he wasn't going to humble himself, he'd given this vision, if you remember last week, of the world tree. And this world tree was not all bad. It provided shade and, and fruit and, and good things for the birds that represent all the people in Nebuchadnezzar's care. But he's this rigid, stubborn tree that will not recognize that heaven rules. And he's got this pride in relationship to heaven. You're going to see it in the first couple of verses here, just how prideful he really is about his own glory and majesty and um, God says he's going to cut down the tree, but he's going to put bands around the stump representing that he's going to protect Nebuchadnezzar. And if Nebuchadnezzar humbles himself, he will exalt him again. And uh, so there's this amazing promise, totally undeserved. And we also talked about how, how long Nebuchadnezzar has been resisting that humbling that God is bringing in his life. I don't know if you've ever seen anything supernaturally unexplainable, but when you have, maybe you prayed. I once prayed for a woman's... Um, ulcer that turned out to be cancerous and it was like a hole in her stomach and they had a, I think it was a CT scan or some kind of scan where the doctors can actually see it so there's evidence, visual evidence of this problem and the husband was just, uh, just weeping in this Bible study because he knew like this is not really survivable and we just got on our knees in the Bible study and prayed and the next week he came back and she had had another scan before going in for surgery which was not very high odds of doing well and they could not find the hole anymore. So I, I have more stories like that where the doctors had no explanation for where it went. This doesn't happen. Cancer's ulcer just doesn't go away. They didn't misdiagnose this. they looking at it and they, they couldn't find it. No explanation. Uh, traveled, the news traveled through the whole hospital. So I have experienced supernatural answers to prayer like that and the, the experience is so humbling. You answered our prayer. We didn't, you did something supernatural for us. So first, 
uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar has this plan to make these amazingly intelligent and scholarly men um, out of the people that he's captured and out of uh, the subject of his nation or the cream of the crop, basically. And he feeds them the best food from the king's table to get the best education. And you can just hear God saying, I'm going to give Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego vegetables and water, and they'll still be 10 times better than the rest of your men that you've planned to train up. And they are. And Nebuchadnezzar sees that. And still, he doesn't acknowledge God's power. And then he has a vision about where, where God is, is telling him, like, yeah, your consolidation of power is golden. I gave you this kingdom, but your legacy he's not going to last and actually it's going to be destroyed by a future king that's going to set up a kingdom and it's the rock that's coming from heaven it's Jesus Christ we know who sets up his eternal kingdom and Nebuchadnezzar knows that their interpretation is true and his legacy won't last but he hardens himself again and decides no 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 it's not just my head that's golden it's my whole body so I'm going to make an image representing my splendor and greatness and the greatness of my gods and if you don't bow down and worship you I'll burn worship me and worship this idol I'll burn you in the fire. And so he gets even more prideful. You know, pride and anger and violence, they're kind of always mixed together. Uh, when people get uh, that high and mighty on themselves, they don't like being thwarted and they get very angry and violent when they're not. So you can just see all the way through, Nebuchadnezzar continues not to humble himself. How many men have got to witness people in a burning hot fiery furnace not burn up? You know, you see these supernatural things. You get dreams interpreted you didn't tell people about, and you feel in your heart they're right. All this supernatural evidence that God rules and not Nebuchadnezzar, um, or that God rules over Nebuchadnezzar's rules, maybe a better way of putting it. Nebuchadnezzar does not humble himself. And then he gets another vision, and he knows in his heart he's afraid about what it means, and Daniel tells him it's about you have not humbled yourself. You need to break off your sin. You need to practice righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the depressed, and but it says that he's going to, by God's hand, receive a mental break or severe mental illness or some psychotic break. He's going to go crazy, think he's a cow, and start eating grass. And that's going to happen for seven times, which uh, I think we'll see is seven years uh, later in the study here. And so he's warned. He's warned that I'm going to humble you with some hard knocks if you do not humble yourself. And he still doesn't do it. And, and that's the setup for where we're at right now. So um, why did I mention the whole story about uh, the, the chopping the wood? Well, as I become a better wood chopper and as you start seeing the grain, you realize I know exactly how to split this wood. And you just get better and better at it. Next thing you know, there's a big stack there. And God is perfectly aware of the fault lines and of the cracks and of the grains of your pride. He knows exactly how to split that pride away from your spirit. And he does so sometimes with a mighty blow. He needed to cut Nebuchadnezzar's pride down. And I think it was a famous preacher. I can't remember the name, so I can't give full credit. But um, he coined the phrase, God brings us to an end of ourselves. God brings us to an end of ourselves. So it's not my phrase, but I really like it. And I'm adopting it. And uh, it's another way of saying that is he, he, he rock bottoms you. He brings you to rock bottom. You know, you hear that a lot with addiction, that oftentimes addicts um, will not recognize the severity of their addiction and decide to do something about it until they hit rock bottom, you know. And oftentimes that rock bottom literally is concrete, concrete of some, you know, cold, dark alley, and they're um, waking up after some night of stupor and drugs. And so that's one kind of rock bottom. But there's another kind of rock bottom of pride where you realize you've ruined a lot of your relationships. Your marriage is in shambles. Your relationship to your children's in shambles. Your relationship to a lot of past managers that you couldn't handle being authority of you are in shambles. If you have that kind of pride and have known for a long time that it's not good and it's not working, um, the question I have for you is do you really have to be brought to an end of yourself before you would humble yourself of that pride? Does it have to be rock bottom? Why would God show so many examples of his intent to humble and giving opportunities to Nebuchadnezzar to humble himself? If he didn't want, do you think that the moral of the story is, yeah, wait till the last minute, harden yourself as much as you can, and then once I make you crazy, once I blight your mind with some terrible delusion, once you've lost your reason, then humble yourself. Surely the point of the story is that God knows how to humble you, and he wants you to surrender to that humbling as soon as you experience it, you know? And I'm on a stage here, but I'll tell you, I have resisted God's humbling more than I have humbled myself quickly in my life. Over and over and over again, I put it off, and I put it off, and I put it off. Let's read the first two verses, and you're going to see Nebuchadnezzar put it off too. 
Verse 28, all this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. What is all this? Well, everything that's been said about him losing his mind, and now we're going to hear how it happened. Verse 29, at the end of 12 months, he was talking on the, uh, walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon. So at the end of 12 months, we know that 12 months have gone by, and what's about to happen to him, he's had a whole year to think about it. Now think about all the time that God has given him and all the events that I just walked through that he was supposed to humble himself over, and God gives him another 12 months. Another 12 months. Have you ever known, just no raise of hands, because I'm not trying to expose anybody, but have you ever known that you had some kind of pride issue? And by the way, anytime you know you're obeying, disobeying God's word, you know that disobeying God's word, sin leads to death. We know that, we believe that. So you know, you know that. But you decide you're going to do it your own way anyway, and you're still going to try to make it work with life. That's guaranteed evidence of some kind of pocket of pride. So we're not necessarily talking about you being megalomaniacs and every one of you has like a fully developed Nebuchadnezzar in you already, uh, but you do have pride, and I do too. And so have you ever, like for a whole year, resisted doing something that God wanted you to do? I have, I definitely have. And I've experienced, and I've told you this many times, this one's not an example about, about me in this case, but as a pastor, I was counting the years. I've been a pastor now for 14 years. I still feel like a young pastor, but I've been a pastor for 14 years. And I have quite a bit of experience of, um, not here at Boone's Ferry, five years here at Boone's Ferry, but uh, about nine or 10 years before that. And um, I have quite a bit of experience in relationship to Christians, both as a congregant to pastors and to other interns, and, um, but also as a pastor to congregants, as a pastor to elders, as an elder, lots of different relationships. And... I have experienced forgiveness. I've experienced people forgiving each other. I've experienced what felt like a relationship breaking event only to turn into this a redemptive moment where we forgive each other and now we're closer than ever and it's just one of those like, wow, God's power is so good. I can't believe it turned out like this. But I've also experienced quite a bit of times where what happens seems like there is almost no Christianity involved, no spirit involved. I'll give you an example, and this is so common, and I don't have anyone in mind, this is not a recent experience, but I could probably list anywhere between five to 10 times where I've done something wrong, but I'm unaware of it in relationship to someone. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not guilty for being unaware, sometimes I'm stubbornly unaware, and um, it's like I kinda know, but I suppress it. But I've done something wrong, I've said something wrong, I've offended someone. And they hold that with them for six months. And then I find out six months later, sometimes I barely remember what I did or vaguely remember it, and I'll say I'm sorry, but before I'm really forgiven, it's another six months, and so that's a year. And then you read, I think it's in Matthew 5, that we're supposed to keep short accounts. And he was speaking about um, Jewish ways of worship, and so before you come bring your gift to the altar, don't even do that if you have some kind of outstanding account in relationship to someone. The modern example would be like, I'm not saying you shouldn't come to worship, but deal with your broken relationships before just coming to worship and pretending like everything's right. We learn in 1 John that you can't say that you love God and hate your neighbor, and to be unforgiving and contemptuous to your neighbor is not love for God. So don't come and worship and praise God and hear sermons when you don't even, again, I shouldn't say don't come. The idea here is have short accounts, forgive quickly. We're talking days and weeks, not months and months, right? Days and weeks. And I wouldn't be surprised if most of us have at least one example in our life where we were like, yeah, no, I'm not going to talk to them. We know Matthew 18, brother sins against you, go talk to them one-on-one -on -one and try to work it out. It's a command. We know we should do it. But we wait six months before even talking to this person. And somehow, interestingly, all the friends know what the problem is because you've talked to every single one of them, which, by the way, is known as gossip. It does never lead to reconciliation. In fact, it messes it up. So six months, and then another six months after that to forgive, and I mean, relationships die in a matter of months when there's absolutely no contact and no forgiveness, right? It gets very cold, very fast, and next thing you know, you feel strange, you feel like you don't even know the person. So we, the, I, I chose that example not because this is a really current example in relationship to me or one that I know of right now, but because it's one of those that is a good example of how we really do resist God for 12 months like that by just not forgiving people. We do it. We do it all the time. So we don't want to think of, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, wow, what a pride monster. Like, well, what about us? What about us? And I, another one is um, it kind of similar uh, as a pastor. Um, 
I almost didn't want to say this because it sounds like I'm like venting about past things, but it's just another really good example. I've, I've actually done this in relationship to a pastor, so I'll put myself right there with you guys. But you convince yourself that it's not going to work out to go talk to the person about it, and so you go to the pastor and tell them the problem and are complaining about something that someone did to you. And, and, and I've done that to a pastor, but then I've also been a pastor that, that ha- I recognize that it's wrong. Um, I guess... As a little side note, if you're going to a pastor and asking how do you think I should approach this with every intent to go to approach that person, you're seeking wisdom, that might be okay. But more often than that, I'm talking about people coming to me talking about this, they have no intent of ever talking to the person. They're just venting about it. And it puts you in a very awkward position because I'm like, you gotta go talk to them, it's not okay. Right? It's not gonna work to, someone sins against you and so you sin by not go talking to them. That's two sins, just make two sins. They don't subtract from each other. It's not how it works. So, and that, and that will happen over and over and over again. And you, you may not know how often that happens in a church when you're not, I'm in a, in a position where that, that happens. People come to me about that. And, uh, and I think that's also related to pride. Like you know it's not gonna work. You know that God said do this. And he didn't say that every single time it will lead to reconciliation. He said just do this. Go talk to them. There's a process for this. So I won't belabor it, but we can think of lots more examples, and you might be thinking of a different one where you've been resisting what God has been telling you to do in a pretty objective and clear way through Scripture for years. And Nebuchadnezzar was doing it too. Listen to verse 30. And the king answered and said, so he's walking out on the roof of the royal palace, and you just imagine him overlooking all of Babylon and, um, and looking at the splendor of his kingdom and all that he's accomplished, and he says this. And the king answered and said, is, it not, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? So I'm going to say something surprising here, but uh, I think you'll agree. Everything in verse 30 that he says is entirely true. That is Babylon. He did build it with his mighty power for his res- and he did it for his own majesty. So it's true. And why is it still wrong? That was a question you were asked in the discipleship community. We had a great study in my group, a uh, great discussion in my group about why it's still wrong. And one of the primary answers for why it's still wrong is, is about credit. He, give credit where credit is due. Why was Nebuchadnezzar able to do this? We learn in other passages, God had given him the kingdom. He'd given the whole earth to reign. Who gave Nebuchadnezzar his amazing mind and leadership ability? I mean, on an even more just simplistic level, who gave Nebuchadnezzar the breath of life? And by whom are the molecules in his brain continually sustained? By God. One that he's been being introduced through, through Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over and over and over again. The only God that has power to know dreams. Only God has power that can override dietary needs, nutritional needs. The only God who can interpret dreams. Only God that can save people from the fire. That very God is nowhere near Nebuchadnezzar's mind. And so there's a principle here that's somewhat to the side of the main point that God knows exactly how to humble you. But I want you to think about what it is that is actual humility. Uh, and this, this happens in churches where we, we become, I think, a little bit unhealthy in our perception of how we should treat success. Uh, another question that was asked in the groups was, uh, does humility require us to dismiss or not acknowledge our own success? Does that mean you, could, you basically have to say, yeah, no, I didn't have not, I'm not accomplished anything great. So as a former football player, we'd always have rewards banquets. And I think if you're in sales, there are probably like rewards banquets for uh, the people who sold the most and had the highest commissions and all that. And like, if you've done a great job at your work and you've really worked hard, uh, should you like refuse any of the honors that come with that? Should you, should you dismiss them? Like, no, 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 I didn't do that. Or should you diminish them and say, uh, eh, it wasn't really that big of a deal. I didn't really do that much. And again, it's, it's quite simple. It's all about whom you're giving credit for that. So I'll just take my job, for example. Um, I'm very encouraged when someone comes up to me and tells me that that was a powerful sermon. And then maybe it gives me an example of how it was meaningful to their life. But I'm also very much aware that um, no matter how 
good my interpretation of scripture is and how elegant my words and how well-crafted the sermon is, even if you could set that apart as my work, which you can't. Uh, where did I get my education, God? Where did I get the money for the education? Where did I get my mind? Where did I give this gift to be able to teach and preach? That all comes from the Holy Spirit, so I'm not going to, but let's just pretend that. Um, the spiritual power to say something from my mind and soul and heart to yours and it's power to be able to make a change in your life. Do you think I have any power to do that? Actually, in some ways, God's given me some ability and human reason to be persuasive. So I have many times in my own power persuaded people of something, but it never goes as deep as a conviction. And so at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, it worked. People are convinced of it. But it, it was my conviction sort of supplying them with agreement for it. It wasn't the Holy Spirit changing them. And so I'm fully aware when I'm given a compliment, that was a powerful sermon, and God knows my heart. Whether I say just thank you, that's really encouraging, or say, wow, thank you, I know it was God at work today, that's, that's special, giving credit to God. God knows when I'm actually giving him credit in my heart. And God knows whether you're giving him credit in your heart too. You might think, oh, I'm never going to be as successful as Nebuchadnezzar, but be encouraged. You will have success in your life, and it may be smaller than you might think. It may be larger than you think, but you will be successful in your endeavors. God blessed even Nebuchadnezzar, who was constantly against him. God's benevolent, and he will give you success. Um, it's not a formula, but, but over and over again, God is so benevolent and good and providentially gracious that he will give you success, and the question is, are you giving him credit for it? And is it you that's so good at your job and you that's providing for your family and you're the one that's doing such a good... You know, we, we bring it all the way down to gardening. You know, I feel the temptation to look at... The, there's, there's at least two people in my neighborhood who always have a greener grass than me. And I work so hard. And I think I used the wrong... I used some kind of weed and feed and it caused all these patches. So now my yard is worse than most other yards. And I'm looking around, I'm like, ah, I worked so hard, you know? And uh, so even like as a suburban father, we start comparing each other's grass. I'm like, uh, mine's, mine's better than yours, you know? Right now, I'd have to look at the worst yard in the neighborhood to feel that way, you know? So we do that. Even gardening, you can be proud of your yard. If you're a mom, you're proud of your parenting. If you're beautiful, you're proud that you're so beautiful. And you were, you were born with that. Like, did you make yourself beautiful? Uh, if you're competent, you're proud in your competence. If you're really intelligent, you're proud of your intelligence. I think intelligence, reason, mental competence to lead and rule, that was Nebuchadnezzar's thing. <coughs> I was really strong in college football. I was prideful about my strength and my physical ability. I'm mentioning all these examples to give you categories to diagnose maybe different pockets of pride in your life and maybe you haven't hit on yours, but that doesn't mean God doesn't know. He knows. He knows. He knows where you locate your pride. He knows the grain and where it's grown in, and he knows the fault lines and where it needs to be split. He does, and you know it too. Actually, I'll, I'll take that back. Sometimes you don't. Your pride has a self-blinding effect. You, you, it's, it's amazing. Like um, I have seen in Bible studies and over my time, people talk about a passage, and they're like looking in their minds at their friend, like, oh, I know someone for whom this is true. And the people who know them best in the Bible study are raising their eyebrows. And I see it, because I'm facilitating, I'm looking around, raising their eyebrows like, it's true about you, but you're talking about your friends? They don't say anything, because they're gracious, and that'd be weird, like, well, you're blind to your own pride here in the middle of a Bible study. It'd be probably not the ideal way to shame someone publicly, you know? <coughs> but we do that. We, we try to tie the... Uh, the convicting things of the Bible, that'd be so good for so-and-so to hear. As if that's why God's having you hear a sermon or read the Bible because he's, it's so important for uh, someone else to hear it but you. And it happens all the time. <coughs> it happens so easily. I've done the same thing. So how, I want you to think about, are, are you in one of those places where you're really giving yourself credit for something good that's happening in your life? Um, I think it's, it's some, some of that is a little bit more s silly than others. Like if you're so proud that you're beautiful versus you're so proud that you did such a hard, a good job at, at your work. Like one, you earned something about, like I'm not saying you earned merit, but like you, you did a good job. It's really true. So what should we do? Should we dismiss it? Should we acknowledge it? Here's what I think we need to do. <coughs> it's actually quite simple. You just need to give credit to God. And it's a dual-edged knife. So on one side, you're trying to deny that you even did anything good. 
or dismiss it or diminish it. And I would consider that to be sort of a false humble, humbleness, like, oh, I didn't do anything. When in your heart you're like, no, I did a lot, but I'm just, I don't want to appear that way. You know? but, but what happens if God does a great work through you and do, you diminish what he did? He still doesn't get credit. So you're always just thinking in your mind, who's getting credit? Who's getting the primary credit? Who's being pointed to for this good thing that happened? If it's God that's being pointed to, it's, it, it, it can't be unhealthy. So, and, and, and I mean pointed to from your heart, because you'll see, uh, I knew lots of football players that um, were living anything but a godly life, but if they scored a touchdown, they were pointing up, right? That's not, that's not the kind of credit we're talking about. Um, on the other side, you might have someone who's quite healthy and humble and, and know that God has done a great work through them. I think Billy Graham knew that. It'd be weird if he didn't. But who was the spirit of his evangelism? Who was it that brought people to faith? Who gave him the gift to bring people to faith in that way? So again, it's just about credit. I think it's healthy when people try to encourage you to receive that encouragement and to recognize God's doing something good through you and there's, there's encouragement to be had. But again, it's like don't block up that road and blockade that road so that God doesn't get the credit. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, um, God loves you crediting him where credit is due and it's always due. So let's continue, verse 31, because there's a consequence to not doing that and to pointing only to himself and his own glory. While the words were still in the king's mouth, like he just got done saying them, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. You shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as an eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. If you wanted to do a word study, this is only tangentially important, but the idea of seven periods of time, the Hebrew word could also be translated as year. Uh, it's just actually one of the range of words of the meaning of, of the word. Uh, the number one meaning is a period of time, but a secondary meaning is a, a year. And I, I tend to believe that it was seven years, not seven months, because uh, his fingernails got so long and his hair got so long. So it was a long time. I, I tell my boys that... Um, I give them consequences if they break the rules. The rules are clearly defined and so are the consequences and uh, they don't like having those consequences. But um, I, he, they asked me, Daddy, have you ever gotten spanked? And uh, I'll say all the time, way worse than you guys and way more often and I deserved it 10 times over. None of you guys were as disobedient and, and strong-willed as I was. And they're like, no, like now. Have you ever been spanked now? And I laughed because it was a funny image. But uh, I was like, yes, I have but it's, it's way worse than what you guys are experiencing. Like, by who? I'm like, by God. And I gave them stories of times where God has disciplined me. And, um, you know, uh, any kind of spanking or a timeout or uh, the kind of consequences that you, that you bring into a child's life, even a, a grounding, you know, you're grounded for a month or you're not allowed to play in a football game, that was the worst. My parents threatened that consequence and that shaped me up like none other. They knew. Like if you know, you need to have leverage on your children. You think that's bad? No. You need to know what matters to them and you need to, because uh, there comes a point in which certain consequences don't work anymore, but you still need to find ways to show them that they can't just do whatever they want. It's not good for children at any age, especially teenage. So, um, Back to the main point here, God gives consequences. The kinds of consequences that God gives, they do test, tend to, they're like years and months. They're adult ones. They're significant. They're hard knocks. And he's not doing that because he's just trying to uh, harm you. It's God knows exactly where the fault lines and the grains and the cracks of your pride are and where you need to be struck. He knows how to break that pride away and it's stubborn and it's so unbelievably well fastened to your being that it, it takes some heavy blows at times, especially if you haven't been surrendering over a given period of time. Now for Nebuchadnezzar, he located his pride and his reason and his intellect and his ability to rule. So that's what God attacks. And I wanna talk about that a little bit. I wanna talk about a couple things we can know or at least one thing we can know about God's character. God is not above striking someone with mental illness to humble them. And we have to recognize that. God is God and he can do what he wants. 
Now you might say, you know, I think of um, like uh, everybody knows uh, when Trump was president that uh, CNN would talk about Trump in a certain way and Fox News would talk about it, uh, Trump in a certain way. In, 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 on average, Fox News seemed to have uh, positive views about the content of Trump's policies and CNN had negative views of the content of Trump's policies. So if Trump did something, CNN was going to put it in a negative light and Fox News was going to put it in a positive light, right? Now my point is not political at all. Take that all away. Think about how you think about God when he strikes someone with mental illness to humble them. Right? If you are CNNing God in this case, if you're, if you're angry at him and upset with him, then you, you think, well, that's wrong. It's wrong that he did that. It's really wrong that he did that. What about free will? Is it like, you, is, you're just going to force him to have a mental break and a psychosis? and It's so forceful. This is not a right thing. But if in this case you have a positive view of God and, 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 and love him, you think the exact opposite. So I look at this and I think, it's so gracious of God. He could have cut him off already. Nebuchadnezzar deserved to not be king 10 times over. According to scripture, the kinds of things that Nebuchadnezzar was doing, oppressing the poor and his violent anger, I mean, he had murderous rage multiple times. Total murderous rage. Uh, he deserved to die. It's, really, it's not too harsh to say that. And yet here he gets such a lesser consequence than what he deserves. Perfectly targeted by the great physician knowing exactly where he needs to be hit in his pride. God knows exactly how to humble Nebuchadnezzar and I think how, how gracious of him. And, and it would have been gracious even if the kingdom had never been returned to him. But if he just struck him with mental illness and then he lost the ability to think too highly of himself, <laughs> literally, you know. Uh, so, I think that's gracious. I think that's good. So it all depends on your relationship to God to how you see this. Is he good and is he gracious and is he a great physician? And are you going to blame a doctor for administering chemo to kill a cancer that was killing a patient? No, you're not. And God is God. He's not just a doctor. He knows everything. He's all powerful and he's good. So I want you to think about that because it's good to bring that into like a pre-humbling moment. All of us, unfortunately, are always in a pre-humbling moment. You never know when the next time it is that God's going to say, okay, that, you're done with that pride. We're done. It's been 12 months. You know, eat grass is the threat. But think about, for, for, for some of you, you might be thinking right now, it's like, well, I don't have a whole lot of pride in my reason and intellect. I'm not that, uh, I'm not that intelligent. I'm not that smart. I'm not that competent. In fact, I feel kind of insecure about those things. And so those are probably not the areas where you're going to locate your pride. Those are not the places where God wants to bring the mall of his humbling, you know, strike. So where, where would they be, though? You know, we've already talked about some and where, where they would be. Um, another one, and uh, I hesitate to say it because this is just so nail on the head, but uh, if you're easily offended, that's where the mall is coming. You know, if you're constantly deeply offended by what people said, and there's something really kind of catch-22, vicious cycle about it. People that are really deeply offended are also really offended to be told that they're deeply offended all the time. So their offense is a very a strong coping mechanism to protect whatever pride that is. And um, why, why is it that people who are constantly offended easily, uh, easily angered are prideful? So they think too highly of themselves. And so when they hear anything near who they really are, how dare you? How dare you? You know, another one would be how we respond to authority. Uh, whatever species of pride in me will will definitely rear its ugly head in relationship to authority. So someone tells me something I think is wrong or uh, to do it, and I basically have to do it because otherwise, you know, I'm not doing what the, uh, you submit, you know, submission. Oh, that will expose pride so quickly. Dirty little word. Everyone hates it. You know, we're going to have to submit. And let's talk about submission for a second because we try to say, no, no, I'm submissive, uh, but I just didn't disagree in this case. I'm like, what? You know, the only two ingredients that are necessary, I said this a lot for submission, is that you don't want to do it and you do it anyway. If you want to do it, you're just walking. Does it get just really quiet in here? You're talking about submission, you know? The Bible talks about it all the time, you know? It's yielding your will to someone else's. And if, so, so scripturally, you need to do that in relationship to the elders. You need to do that in relationship to your pastor. And I'm nowhere near worthy of that. And you could poke all kinds of holes in my character and be like, I'm not going to submit to that guy, you know? And you can easily do that. You can do that in relationship to your bosses. You can do that in relationship to governors. And during the pandemic, what they're putting restrictions in, I think most of us disagree with. It's really easy, you know? 
But the elders decided not even to obey some of the restrictions. We were never going to force you to mass. We were never going to force you to get vaccinated. We don't believe that God has given the authority over those kinds of decisions within the church to those governors, but rather to the elders, right? So I'm not saying there aren't exemptions. God knows, though. God knows whether you're actually ever willing to submit. So uh, the reason why I'm telling that is like as self-diagnostic tools. Do you have a problem with authority? Are you constantly bumping into it? Is every boss you've ever had a bad boss? You know? You wonder, well, maybe is it you that's a bad employee? It was me. I had such a bad relationship to my college coaches. My high school coaches were great. I had a great relationship to them. High character men. My college coaches were not great and exposed just how unwilling I really was to follow. And the only thing that kept me following was the threat of losing my scholarship. That's not submission. That's not yielding your heart to another, and that will bring no glory to God. So I'm not going to be able to hit all the different possible species of pride, but you need to be thinking about where have you been resisting God so long that he's about to bring them all, and he's about to have to bring you to an end of yourself? He loves you enough to do that, but you don't have to take it that far. You don't have to take it that far. I also want to talk about mental illness. We talked about the fact that God will use whatever tool is necessary, whatever is the exact right tool, to bring you to an end of yourself. Uh, so wherever you've located your pride, that's where he's bringing just the tip of that axe. But there's... Again, this is a side point, but I think it's really valuable to talk about when you talk about mental illness. Mental illness has been a hot topic, and it's, it's growing and growing and growing. Um, I have a hard time, especially these days, knowing exactly what sources to, uh, to trust, but I read a statistic that um, prescriptions for uh, drugs for mental illness were up by 400% during the pandemic. 400%. So, and that means that, I mean, if you're doing this in an ethical way, that means that those... Uh, um, diagnostics, uh, diagnoses, diagnoses, diagnoses of those different mental disorders are up by 400%. Because you can't just give out some high-powered uh, prescription drug if someone isn't actually diagnosed with some kind of mental disorder. Now, I'm going to be very careful because I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. My power base, where I feel that I have the authority to speak is scripture. So I want to not go anywhere near outside of that. I, I think that... Uh, I don't like it when, when people just delve into biblical interpretation without any development or tools or expertise in that either. But my, my point is, logically, you have to think about, did 400% more people go crazy during the pandemic? Is it really that much? Were none of these things treatable in other ways other than pharmaceutical drugs? I ask myself those questions. And here's where we stay within the power base. I actually want you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, Okay. So, and I'm going to tell you a story so that you know exactly what I mean and what I don't mean. And also, while you're turning there, let me just say, I believe that um, psychotic issues, real mental illness, um, disorders of the mind are very much a real thing. So you might hear me say things like, oh, he doesn't think any of the mental illness is real. Uh, not true, I do. But I am going to say something that challenges some of that belief. Another thing is that I do not believe, and I would never say, neither would the elders or any good teacher of the Bible, that um, all mental illness, or even a majority of mental illness, is the fault of the person, right? Some mental illness is a result of the fallen world, of broken minds. But I will say, and for example, Nebuchadnezzar would be a perfect example, that some mental illness is the fault of the person who's mentally ill. It's uh, self-destructive things that have happened. Let's say maybe it's mental illness that came as a result of natural causes, you know, um, self-destructive behavior. Uh, there are things you can do, even patterns of thought you can engage in that begin to break your mind. Um, I was about to talk about OCD, but again, that's just outside of, I want to stay very disciplined here. So um, my point is that some mental illness is actually the fault of the person who is experiencing the mental illness. And you could, you, I don't know how much, like is it all? Is, do you have some mental illness as a result of a broken world and some mental illness as a result of their behavior, actions, God's work to like make them pay attention to something and limit their faculties that only that can be paid attention to? Don't know, not my point and also not that important to know. 
But listen to this. Here is Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. If you believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has come to reside in you permanently, indwell you. He's there. Uh, you also have your own spirit, you have your own body, and we're not talking about the flesh that you can touch, but here the flesh in this case is your own sinful, broken desires. And those are like a warrior in your life, opposed to the warrior of God's spirit. They want the exact opposite thing. The spirit's like, be unselfish. Get up early with the children and let your wife sleep in, and your flesh is like, no, I want to sleep. I deserve to sleep. I preached yesterday. It was so hard. You know, just sleep one more hour. Let her get up. You know, feel the war. And according to Romans um, 8, the, the flesh needs to be put to death by the spirit. You don't have the power to kill your own flesh, but the spirit does. But the spirit is, and I think of him as a gentleman, and he asks for your surrender. Let me kill it. I want to kill your flesh. Say yes, you know. And even with this mental illness, God didn't just say, in this case, now you're humbled. There was still, again, if you're seeing any God, there was no free will. But I look at this and I think, see, he still surrendered. He still admitted that heaven rules, ultimately. Nebuchadnezzar exists, his will exists, and with his will he said, heaven rules. It took mental illness for him to get there. So, back to my point about mental illness. The only point that I want to make is that we have a society that is deeply and significantly influenced by the enemy. Everything the enemy wants is the opposite of what God wants. God wants redemption. He wants it to start with repentance. He wants you to admit, I need to humble myself. I've been sinning. I've been against you. I've been against the rule of your son in heaven. I know that. I know he died for me. I know I have no excuse. He wants you to humble yourself. Satan wants the exact opposite. He wants you to make excuses. He wants you not to admit your sin. He wants you to feel really nebulously guilty about a lot of things, but not receive any real conviction so that you might actually confess a specific sin. And Satan will use whatever tactics he can. And one of them that he is obviously currently using for anyone that's paying attention has the sermon is mental illness. Let me give you an example. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under law. Verse 18. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And what Paul means is those who do such things unrepentantly without redemption will not be saved, will not be in the kingdom of heaven, will not ultimately be forgiven for them because they didn't repent. So I want to focus in specifically on fits of anger because my story is a fits of anger. And this is a real life story, but I've jumbled up the details and I'm not giving names and uh, for a very specific reason because anonymity is important. But in this case, I have a friend. He calls me up and he has a friend. And that friend is um, flying into fits of rage and it's harming everyone around him. And it's getting really serious. And people are in danger because of the fits of rage that he's in. And this friend has a group of friends that are also Christians. Uh, some of, uh, of them are Christians that... Um, I would say are mature and really trust scripture. Some of them are less mature, but you wouldn't, based on what they say, you wouldn't know. They all think they're mature. And so he's saying, whose advice is right? And he's calling me. It's actually happened, uh, but again, in different, different details. And he's saying, my sense is that this person needs to repent of their fits of rage. And that it's really uh, 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 in the realm of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and not in the realm of modern uh, psychiatrics to deal with this. And I said, why, do, why are you even juxtaposing those two? Yeah, like he has fits of rage. What's the antidote to that? How does the warrior of the Holy Spirit, is fruit of Holy, the Holy Spirit fruit of self-control and peace and kindness? And I'm a, manger, a man who, who experienced fits of rage, and it's all the way through my history. My grandfather was just an absolute rage monster, uh, you know, blood boiling, screaming, raging anger at these, you know, farmers and people who did him wrong. And, and so it's just coming all the way through my history, and uh, God's redeeming a lot of that. And... Um, but I know, like, I'm culpable for that anger. Like, it was me. It says, be angry and do not sin in Scripture, but it was me that did harm with that anger. I did it. Okay. Satan's like, no, no, it's your mental illness. Oh, I'm a victim. I'm mentally ill. It's, that feels so much better than my flesh getting stabbed to death by the Holy Spirit. 
You know, I feel so much better that like it's not my fault. I have something wrong with me. Now again, there could be real, genuine, diagnosed, chemical imbalance kind of stuff, mental illness, that is leading to irritability and to these kinds of problems. We're not talking about that. That's not my area. I'm talking about things like fits of rage that are really just the result of a lack of the control of the Holy Spirit. And this person that, that I'm talking about um, in the story, one, one part that's true is that they were a Christian. And so what they end up choosing is to go through a round of psychiatric secular counseling. You know? And what they were told is, okay, here's the tool, here's what you need to do. You need to explain to people why you're getting so angry at, at them. And so now the person's going around explaining to every person that angers them exactly why they're getting so angry at them. And still getting really angry at them. Nothing's changed. Nothing's been transformed. And I don't know the details of whether they end up uh, using pills and different ways of, of dealing with whatever mental illness they were diagnosed with. But I'll tell you one thing. A pill will never make you more like Jesus. Never, ever. God has not decided to use pharmaceuticals to transform you into the likeness of Christ. And fits of anger, out of control. Jesus got angry, didn't sin. Fits of anger, out of control, sinful, destructive, like Nebuchadnezzar, or like anyone here where it happens, you know, sometimes behind closed doors. Those are areas that the Holy Spirit wants to take control and heaven wants to rule. Jesus wants to rule in your life. And so you let him. And it's amazing. He's supernaturally powerful. He, have you ever surrendered your anger and thought, oh, I feel like my spirit's being overruled? No, it's like he's just dissipating it. Like you got all this black anger in, in this beaker and he just pours so much cooling water and it just goes away. And it's like, oh, I'm really, I'm cleansed of the anger. You gave it up. You relinquished it. You let it go. This is the kind of power that the Holy Spirit has. So that would just be one example where I believe we could be basically justifying sinful behavior by saying I'm mentally ill and our society is doing it. Everything's mental illness fault. And the reason why that's so wrong is that it never leads to repentance, reconciliation, and redemption. If you blame someone or something else. It's mental illness. It'd be like if uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, no, I wasn't prideful. You gave me mental illness. He's now blaming God for the mental illness. It's, it's not humility. It's not humbling. So um, I don't think I even need to say again that I do believe there are real situations of mental illness. And I think we, I mean, I actually went to a recovery ministry where there are quite a people with broken minds. And uh, it's really sad. Uh, the, compassion is due in those cases. It's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about just finding whatever way we can to excuse ourselves from sin. To excuse ourselves from sin that the Holy Spirit wants us to master through surrender to his power. So, that's enough about mental illness. Let's continue to the really exciting part because Nebuchadnezzar, a tyrant, a megalomaniac, absolute pride master, actually humbles himself. <coughs> At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, so after the end of these seven years or these seven periods of time, Nebuchadnezzar lifted my highest eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from ever. From generation to generation, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and resplendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. I want you to think about the person you think is most prideful in your life. In this case, I don't want you to point to yourself. I actually want to, because we do this. We do point at someone else like, what a megalomaniac. And I'm guessing that for some of you, it might be um, leaders in political places or people that are in charge of schools or whoever, you know. Um, so you have that person in your mind. And, and I want to ask you, have you, have you any faith that God knows how to humble them and is at work? We don't know who God is going to humble and who God is not going to humble. Um, after the lion's den, we find out a story about Belteshazzar and God does not humble him. God judges him for his pride. But do you have any faith? Have you once prayed 
for your most prideful enemy that God would humble them. I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar made a lot of enemies. What, is, what does Jesus say? Love your enemies. That love them as yourself. How would you like an enemy to think about you? Would you like them to pray that you might be humbled? I want you to think about that. Do you think that person could actually be humbled? Think of our president. How do we know that our president is not humble? Because he supports abortion. He supports the killing of children in the womb. Do you think he could be humbled? Do you have faith that he, have you prayed for him? Someone might argue that he's already had his mental break and so he's halfway there. Oh man, I labored over whether that was an okay joke to make. (laughs) Did it, so there it is. But seriously, Biden has a human soul. And he has a relationship to the Lord. I don't believe a saving relationship to the Lord, but do you actually want him to have a saving relationship to the Lord? Have you spent more energy talking about how much you can't stand a certain political leader and how prideful they are, whoever it is, than you have praying for them? Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in heaven with us forever. That's how we should desire for even our greatest enemies and the people that we find most prideful. And that is how God relates to us. I said that God knows how to humble every single one of us. And in, in one way, it's generic. We all enter the kingdom of heaven through only one door, and it's a bloody cross bought door of suffering for Jesus Christ. It's one that he had to die for. But the way that it is unique for each one of us is every one of you is different in their pride. Not a single one of you has a pride that's exactly the same as somebody else because you are uniquely made in the image of God and have different gifts and abilities and a a different lifeline and life story. And every single one of us has to look at the cross and say, that is what all my greatest deeds and greatest accomplishments are required of of Jesus Christ for him to be killed just so that I would be considered to be allowed to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's It's a door where not a single one of your accomplishments, not a single ounce of your merit can enter. You can't even say, I humbled myself, therefore I deserved to enter heaven. What does Nebuchadnezzar conclude? And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. What did Nebuchadnezzar actually do with his free will? Constantly embolden his own pride. What did he do when he had his faculties removed? Finally surrender. So God knows exactly how to humble you. He's always going to do it to, about, with the cross. If you wonder, if you really want the best diagnostic tool, better than anything I've said today, look at the cross. Remember all of the ways in which Jesus had to die for your sin and yours alone just for you to be saved and in a saving relationship to him and be worthy of heaven. And no pride is allowed to survive. And and that's also the place, though, where you realize this king is not using a hammer anymore. He died because he loves you. He died to atone for your sin and pay for your sin while you were still a sinner and trade his righteousness for yours, receive your sin for his righteousness, an unbelievable exchange, experience the wrath of God completely undeservingly as a lamb without blemish, perfect and innocent, for someone that was not without blemish, who was soiled and sinful and broken and wrong and prideful about it altogether. And he died for you. And so wouldn't you want to surrender your will to a king like that? There's nobody else like him. There's nobody else like him. That's who we humble ourselves to. There is no person easier to humble yourself in front of than Jesus Christ. No one. He's made it as easy as it could possibly be, but it still requires a death. Taking up your cross doesn't mean dealing with the most difficult people in your life and suffering through it. It means taking up the cross where your flesh is continually mortified, killed by the Spirit over and over again. It's very painful. It's very, you sometimes feel humpty dumpty by God and you're not sure he's going to put you together again. You know, I've experienced that. It's very painful. So I want to pray for us I think I've said enough today. God knows how to humble you. He knows the fault lines of your pride. And I don't want the ax to strike any of my rounds. I don't want it to strike any of yours either. Right now is a perfect time to humble yourself. And what are we doing during communion? We're coming to the foot of the cross. 
We're remembering the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're remembering what it cost him in his broken body and his shed blood. So as Emily comes up today to lead us in worship, I want us to be sensitive to Holy Spirit. Just actually ask God if you would. If you would ask God, Lord, where do I need to humble myself? Where have I been resisting for years? Where do I need to come to the cross and recognize that I'm not good enough? That I can't earn your favor? Where I need forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation? And he'll give you the power to live that life too. It won't be fake. You won't just be white knuckling it. It's the Holy Spirit transforming you supernaturally, making you a new person. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your power to humble us. And Lord, you can do it in ways that don't humiliate us. You can do it in such gentle and wonderful ways. And I pray that for this congregation. I pray that we wouldn't have to be brought all the way to a painful destructive end of ourselves I pray that it wouldn't take seven years for us I pray that we'd humble ourselves right now today and then undeservingly Lord but according to the promise of your word that you would exalt us that you'd restore us to the places that we've broken that you'd give us success in the work of our hands but that we'd be shaped in such a way that the credit comes to you quickly I pray these things in Jesus name Amen